What is up guys? Well, with the release of The Flash this weekend, we now have 14 different films in the DCEU to discuss, and I think only one or two more before we're gonna reset this bitch and not have to do whole brand new rankings. Yay. I have reviewed the vast majority of this universe, so if you want to check out some more in-depth thoughts on any of these movies, please check this playlist up here for all of those reviews. And this should go without saying, but never does. This is my own personal preference, my own personal ranking. I don't expect you guys to agree with it 100%, nor should you agree with it 100%. So please just put your ranking down below and we can discuss them as DC fans. No reason to get all hot and bothered. You can still watch Zack Snyder's Justice League every night while you're curled up with your pillow before you go to bed at night. My opinion doesn't change that. And with that being said, number 14, the only movie on this list that I pretty much despise, and that is Justice League, the original theatrical cut of Justice League. I don't need to get into the history of this, that's pretty widely known, but Zack Snyder had already shot the majority of this movie with the script that was approved by the studio. He had a personal tragedy, had to step away from the film. They yanked the movie away from him, gave it to Joss Whedon, who was very popular at the time for having directed the first two Avengers films pretty successfully, and they retooled and reshot the vast majority of the movie and put out this hack job of a film that doesn't work whatsoever just as a movie. And once you actually see the Zack Snyder Justice League and you know more about the details of what the studio did to yank it away from him, it just comes across as gross. So... I guess if you have a very low bar as far as what is entertaining in a comic book film, this movie is good enough. But the thing was damn near an embarrassment to have the Justice League name on it. It was the lowest grossing of any of the DC movies at the time, which is pretty pitiful for a Justice League movie. And compared to the original version of this film, this thing is inferior on almost every single level. So I don't see myself ever rewatching this version of the movie. I believe in truth. But I'm also a big fan of justice. Now with that out of the way, though a lot of us aren't in danger of having studios yank our baby away from us and give some bastardized version to the masses, we are in fact open to the threat of cybersecurity and identity theft, so if you want to protect yourself from those, please check out the sponsor of today's video, Aura. Nowadays, bigger and bigger pieces of our lives are tied to online accounts and social media profiles, making cybersecurity and identity theft a growing concern in our everyday lives. In fact, identity theft is the fastest growing crime in this country with a new victim nearly every 14 seconds. That's why I'm excited to partner today with Aura, which is an easy to use app that has every single tool that you will need to stay safe online. Identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, VPN, password management, and even antivirus software. And using Aura, you can even get near real-time credit inquiries, which will let you know if somebody is trying to open up a credit card or a loan using your personal information. And while I'm sure most of you watching this video have one or a few of those things, if you don't have every single one of them in your arsenal, it's like locking all your doors at night while leaving the windows wide open. And let's call it like it is, it's much easier and more appealing to have all of those tools under one app and one bill. The day that I activated my account, I got over 50 notifications of my email address showing up on the dark web. That's a dark corner of the internet where hackers buy, trade, and sell your personal information. So let Aura do the heavy lifting to keep you safe while surfing online by using my exclusive link and getting a 14-day free trial. And you will be shocked at how much of your personal information they protect just in those 14 days. So go to Aura.com slash Cody Leach or use this QR code to start your trial of Aura today. And thank you so much to Aura for sponsoring today's video. Coming in at number 13, is going to be Suicide Squad. Now, David Ayer has been campaigning ever since the Zack Snyder Justice League cut got released on HBO Max to get his original cut of this film released, and I'm pretty confident whatever his original vision of this movie was is probably better than what we got, but I don't think he's actually going to see that come to fruition, certainly not anytime soon. So the only version of this movie that we're able to judge is the theatrical version, which is just about as much of a hack job as the Justice League and the theatrical version of Batman v Superman that we haven't talked about yet. The early days of the DCEU were tumultuous, to say the least. So essentially you had this film where you get this ragtag group of criminals and supervillains together and they're going to go off and save the world and you had a really great cast, you had a really good concept there that was going to be an interesting kind of jump off point from the first two DCEU films 
And the studio took it away from David Ayer and recut the movie with the trailer company to make it more like Guardians of the Galaxy and have more popular music thrown in there and have more of a music video flair. And because of that, the movie's just an absolute mess. There's still entertainment value to be had. The cast is still awesome with a lot of these characters. I mean, Margot Robbie is awesome and iconic as Harley Quinn. I loved Will Smith as Deadshot. I'm not really the biggest fan of Jared Leto's Joker, but I still kind of contend that we didn't really get to see enough of him to judge completely fairly. But even the other characters, just a really nice group, a nice cast, a nice dynamic with all of them that could have made for a really fun ground level comic book film. But it's just one of those movies that you watch and you see all the studio heads and all the suits just putting input and cutting scenes and removing things. And even Jared Leto's Joker, vast majority of screen time just yanked away, thrown onto the cutting room floor, which is just baffling for the level of popularity that character had. And so it's it's entertaining enough. I would absolutely be curious to see David Ayer's cut of this, but the version that we have, not very good. Coming in at number 12 for me is going to be Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Now, I'll fully admit this might just be a recency thing. When we get some time and distance away from the recent releases of the DCEU, I might shift my opinions on a few of these more recent films, but I just didn't really enjoy this one. Like on paper, it was fine. I think I gave it overall a positive review and I would stand by that, but I just don't have any desire to ever rewatch this. And rewatchability plays very highly into my rankings and you'll see more of that as we get closer to the top. And this one, I, for as much as I really enjoyed the first Shazam film and I was genuinely looking forward to a sequel, the closer we got to the release, the less excited that I got because of the marketing and the story that was released and the fact that they were just basically advertising the entire film, which just shows no confidence. The studio absolutely buried this thing and I kind of fell victim to a lot of their, uh, their marketing the way that they released this film. But I just found this to be a very run-of-the-mill, generic superhero film. You got good guys in capes, you got bad guys in capes, and they smash into each other in the sky until the movie's over and the credits run. I didn't think they did anything interesting in advancing the character of Shazam or Billy. I don't think that Zachary Levi's performance as Shazam lines up with the age of Billy and the maturity of Billy anymore and that was a little bit awkward. I didn't think that the humor was nearly as funny or as engaging as the first film. Yet again, another pretty lackluster villain, even though you've got Helen Mirren and Lucy Liu here, two very capable actors. And so I just kind of left numb. You know, it's like, okay, you did your job. It was entertaining. It was flashy. It was, you know, some spectacle in there, but I just don't feel anything. I, I don't care. Barely edging that one out at 11 is going to be Wonder Woman 1984, and this was a giant disappointment for how much that I loved the first Wonder Woman, and this was one of the first movies that we got to see after the world kind of shut down and movies weren't coming out for a while, so it was kind of a movie that I really needed to be this great experience to kind of uplift myself, but it just, it just wasn't. I still love Gal Gadot in the role, and that's kind of what edged this out over Shazam, is just a there's a lot of charm, there's a lot of mileage that I can get out of just watching her do her thing as Wonder Woman. Uh, I think that some of what they're going for here with capturing that 1984 era and the colors and uh, the, the kind of vibe of that era, I thought they did pretty decently. The villain in this one, Cheetah, was pretty reminiscent of a lot of other villains that we have seen, like you know the Riddler and Batman Forever, and just somebody who's scorned by the hero and kind of wants to come back and take him down a peg. Not the most unique tale in the world. But the biggest issue with this was that I just felt like the humor was way off. I felt like the tone was way off from the first film. And there's a lot of really problematic things they do with the story that just why they didn't stop and think for more than a second about how that was going to come across baffles me. Like having the spirit of Steve go into a random dude's body while Wonder Woman is fucking him and he's just kind of like a slave to whatever they're doing until she eventually lets him go. I volunteer! I volunteer! I volunteer as tribute. It's not portrayed as being that dark or serious, but you think about it for more than a second and you're like, that's kind of fucked up. I don't know many dudes that would complain or, you know, raise their hand and address concerns regarding to that deal, but 
it, it's still kind of fucked up. Number 10 is going to be Black Adam, and this very much like Shazam Fury of the Gods is a movie that I'm just kind of numb to. Uh, it was a very run-of-the-mill, generic, been-there-done-that type of superhero film that they had been just hyping up and marketing and talking about for like a decade. And when you finally get the product, you're like, dude, that was not worth the wait whatsoever. I love The Rock. It's been hard for me to keep that love here lately because it feels like his ego has really started to kind of <laughs> get a little bit intolerable for me. And this is one of the bigger examples of that where he quite literally tried to just take the DCEU and make it his thing, where it was going to be him and Henry Cavill Superman, and they were going to rule the world. And so by the end of it, the, the interesting things that this movie sets up go absolutely nowhere because of the fate of the DCEU, and it just kind of was a giant kick in the nuts to some of his fans that really wanted to see some version of that come to fruition. And even before all of that, it's the rock flying around being a little bit of a villain, more like an anti-hero. Can we just have a fucking villain, please? Not an anti-hero. Black Adam's a villain. And then you have the Justice Society in there, which was the most entertaining part of the movie for me. Seeing like Pierce Brosnan and a few of those people as the Justice Society, that was the engaging part here. Not Black Adam, the titular character. Maybe if this movie came out 10 years prior when they were actually talking about doing this, I would have got more entertainment value out of it, but after the last decade of comic book films and how comic book films have evolved and our expectations for those films have evolved, this just didn't cut it. Number nine is gonna be Birds of Prey, uh, the Harley Quinn fantabulous movie with a ridiculous title. This is a fun enough movie. You know, it's perfectly innocent. It was meant to be just a Harley Quinn little side story to explore more of that character and have a good time. Does it succeed on most of that? Absolutely. It just kind of falls victim to not being as interesting or as, you know, relevant to bigger events in this universe to some of the movies that I have higher than this. You know, the, the humor in it was pretty good. I appreciated the fact that it was rated R and you could kind of get more of those, some of those darker elements in here, although I don't feel like it needed to be rated R because... One of the problems we have in the DCEU is just the tones are all over the place for what's supposed to be a connected universe, but nonetheless, I thought that Black Mask and uh, Ewan McGregor was pretty decent as a villain, not nearly as interesting as I would hope that villain would be, but if you like Harley Quinn and you like what Margot Robbie does, she continues to really excel in the role and she has a lot of fun with what is going on. And the fact that the movie's kind of told from her perspective in this unreliable narrator style was really interesting. The Birds of Prey stuff specifically felt kind of tacked on like they were trying to do a backdoor pilot for some other movie starring them. But overall, it works together as a decent enough DCEU experience. Coming in at number eight is the most complicated placement for me, and that is Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. And I am talking specifically about the Ultimate Edition. I don't even acknowledge the theatrical cut. I haven't watched it since the theaters, nor will I ever watch it again. And so this is a movie of kind of like two halves. There's half of this movie that I really love and appreciate, and I like how epic and dark and mythic and really interesting it is and unique, especially among the time that it came out. And then there's the other half that is just very awkward and almost feels like three movies shoved into one because it quite literally is to a certain degree. You got the Batman movie, you got the Superman sequel, and then you got the Dawn of Justice stuff, like the, the backdoor pilot of Justice League. Never been a fan of Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor. Never will be a fan of that. I just don't like that interpretation of the character whatsoever. Is it new? Is it fresh? Is it unique? Absolutely. Do I like it? No. So you have the introduction of Ben Affleck's Batman, which I'm a huge fan of. You have the continuation of Henry Cavill's Superman, which I'm a huge fan of. You have the introduction of Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, who I'm a huge fan of. You have the Zack Snyder style here, which I'm a huge fan of. There's some really dark and interesting ways that they tie these characters together and explore them in ways that we have not seen done before. It turned a lot of people off. I appreciated more than I did not. And I like the fact that it has this very mythic feel to it, which is very, like I've said, unique among the style of comic books that was more prevalent in the time that this came out. But this was just a rush job. This is a movie that should have been a standalone Batman film, a Henry Cavill Superman sequel, then you do the Batman v Superman stuff, and then we start talking about Justice League. But they were just hitting the fast forward button trying to get to Justice League as fast as possible, like they were in some kind of a race with Marvel and Avengers, 
and this is the product that you get. You get a whole bunch of ideas shoved together that don't have enough time to really gestate or to be properly explored. And so the movie, no matter what cut you watch, always feels like this movie that should have been a couple of different films and a couple of different stories. So while a lot of me wants to love it, there's a big part of me that just never can completely get there. Coming in at number seven is gonna be Shazam. And I used to like this movie a lot more, and I'll, I'll repeat this again here in a little bit. I've kind of gotten a little bit less interested in this tone of a comic book film with the last couple of years of movies that we have gotten. So this might jump back up in time, who knows? As of right now, this is where it sits. Perfectly fine, innocent, uh, really enjoyable, more family-friendly time in the DCEU. I like the concept of the character of Shazam having a kid that's endowed with superpowers. I think in this first film, Zachary Levi's personality and his humor really comes across well, some genuinely funny stuff, and the back-and-forth personality between him and the kid, Billy. Billy's introduction into this foster family and his chemistry with those characters is really good. The villain, not the most interesting. The third act being that you have the family comes together and everybody gets superpowers is cool, but doesn't make for the most interesting third act in the world. Again, just good guys in capes, bad guys in capes. But for the type of movie this is going for, more of a low level, ground level, family fun adventure, I think that it succeeds pretty damn well. Coming in at number six is gonna be James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, a much, much, much better version of this type of movie. I think that his humor and his very dark take on a lot of things and you know his trauma background and movies like Super starts to bleed in here where he's allowed to just be this unforgiving rated R movie. And I think this succeeds with that rated R stuff a lot more than Birds of Prey did and I like the cast of characters here. I still wish that some of the characters from the original Suicide Squad movie got brought in here besides Harley Quinn, but I'll take what I can get because all the other characters we get here are pretty damn fun as well. Idris Elba is great. Uh, I'm not, I wasn't the biggest fan of John Cena, but I love him in here as Peacemaker, and I also really enjoyed that show, although that won't make this list. I thought that Rick Flagg coming back and Joel Kinnaman's performance and everything was really good. Margot Robbie continues to be great as Harley Quinn. And even some of the other side characters were big standouts. King Shark, played by Sly himself, was a lot of fun. This is the movie that got the mix right, where you have these fun, zany, ridiculous characters. The movie has all the fun you can have with them. It's unforgivingly violent and bloody. And it's just one of those types of films where if you like James Gunn's style and his sense of humor, it's completely unleashed here. And I had a really good time with it. Coming in at number five is going to be Aquaman. And I've dropped on this one a little bit. It used to be number two for quite a long time, which used to always get me shit in the comments section. But I don't know what it is. I used to love this movie. And even the goofier side of things, which I'm normally a bit more critical on, I really appreciated just something about the way that James Wan executed the sillier elements of Aquaman just kind of worked for me. And I don't know if it's just because of the way that the universe has gone. We got Aquaman 2 that's going to be coming out supposedly sometime this year, and I just have no excitement for it. The way that they've continued to utilize the character of Aquaman feels like they don't know what to do with him. And so, I don't know. Something about that has kind of made me soften on this movie a little bit with the, the amount of love that I've had for it. I still think it's a really good adventure. I still love Jason Momoa in the role, and I like kind of his party guy personality that he brings to this, although Amber Heard's a terrible person. I think that she has decent enough chemistry with Jason Momoa. Not the best, but certainly far from the worst. I like the globe-trotting adventure side of things here, the whole king trying to reclaim his kingdom, which is a bit of a cliche, but I enjoy their take on it. And a lot of the special effects regarding the underwater stuff and especially the trench sequence or when he has the giant Leviathan thing come through in the third act, I think a lot of that shit's metal as fuck. So it's always really appealed to me. I think I've just got to a point where a lot of these lighter hearted comic book films have just started to kind of drop in my interest. I want something that's a little more mature, a little darker, a little bit more unique, I guess. So... Here recently, I'm not as big of a fan as Aquaman as I used to be. Coming in at number four is going to be Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now, although it's number four out of, what, 14 movies, and that's pretty damn high praise, there's going to be a bunch of people in the comments going, How dare you? What the hell's wrong with you? It's all about rewatch factor. Otherwise, this would be a little bit higher. There's very, very rare times where I'm going to be in the mood to pop in a four-hour movie. 
<laughs> so that's really the main negative with this movie that it's got it at number four, which is fine. I think that this is significantly better by miles than the Justice League cut to a point where it was almost shocking. Like when this was being hyped up and being rumored and finally being released and everybody was getting excited about it, I was like, okay, I'm curious, but like how much better is it really going to be? Like, is it really going to be this totally different film? I guess we'll find out. And yes, it was. Basically every single thing in the Justice League cut, this is a better version of that. And to the point where some things you're like, why the hell did you cut that? Why did you do an alternate version of this? What, what were you smoking? To think that this wouldn't work. And so I kind of would be curious to see what, like an alternate universe, what would happen if this had been released to the public, like a three hour cut, how they would have responded to it without the comparison of the Justice League. But I like the way that they bring all these characters together. I like the way that it keeps that very darker, more mythic, grounded take that Zack Snyder goes for, but it incorporates a little bit more fun here and there. I love the sequence where they're all trying to take down Superman and he just wipes the floor with all of them. I think that the way that they kind of complete the arc of Ben Affleck's Batman is pretty satisfying here. The cast of the other characters, I like. Like, of course, Jason Momoa, I liked him more in the Aquaman movie than I did here, but he's good here. I think that Ezra Miller does pretty well with their version of The Flash, but that version of Barry Allen's always been a little too quirky for my taste, but you know they do well with it, what the movie requires them to. The, the big standout sequence going through the Speed Force is definitely cool. Ray Fisher is Cyborg, probably my least favorite character of the movie, but he does just fine. And so for a four hour Justice League movie, this is one of those few comic book films that I think earns the word epic. And so when I'm in the mood for it, the rare occasion that I'm in the mood for it, it absolutely delivers what I would want out of a conclusion to Zack Snyder's story. It's just not a movie that I'm going to be in the mood to watch that often. Coming in at number three is going to be The Flash. And just like I said with some of my lower ones, this also might be a bit of recency. I only saw this a week ago. And so there's aspects of this movie that I really look forward to rewatching it for. And as I said, rewatch factor plays pretty high. This is a really fun, enjoyable adventure that I could see myself rewatching quite a bit. A lot of the elements to it with the time travel and the winks and nods at the DC eras of the past and DC characters of the past and incorporating Michael Keaton's Batman and an alternate version of Man of Steel, like a lot of those fan service type elements that I feel like comic book films of today have just absolutely overblown and overused. This is one of the better examples of that to where it's actually utilized in a way that gives me the feels that I should have for those types of things instead of just feeling like cheap fan service to cover up a weak script. And so that's a high praise for this that I can give. I enjoy what Ezra Miller does with The Flash. It's still not the type of Barry Allen that I would like to see. It's still a little too quirky. He's still a little bit more dim-witted and zany than I would like. But if I'm on board for this version, I'm watching a story with this version of Barry Allen, I think that Ezra does pretty damn good in this movie. Michael Keaton coming back, as I've already said, was cool. I really enjoyed the Supergirl that we got here. I wish we could see more of her. And it's just a really fun adventure that has a solid three-act structure that's continuously changing up and giving us new elements that we're going to be exploring throughout those three acts. So I was never bored. And I could find this to be a really rewatchable, continuously entertaining chapter in the DCEU. The CGI is damn near trash in a lot of this movie. A lot of the magic, a lot of the things that they're setting up here, it, it's a serious shame because you're like, well, shit, you finally nailed the DC Universe aspect of this whole thing right before we're getting ready to cut this bitch off and reset it. But you know, it's not fair to hold this movie against it for that. It's just the cards that it was dealt, but highly entertaining movie. Coming in at number two is going to be Wonder Woman. And this was a movie that I didn't have a whole lot of faith in. This was like the dark times of the DCEU. This was after we got the botched BVS release. This was after we got the botched Suicide Squad release. And I remember everybody was just like, this is done. Just, just, just stop, just reset it. There's no hope. And then Wonder Woman came along and gave everybody hope, because this movie was fantastic. Gal Gadot, who, again, another element I didn't have a whole lot of faith in, because all I had seen her in was the Fast and the Furious movies, and I was like, yeah, she's a model that can act okay. And she's terrific as Diana. She's terrific as Wonder Woman. And the tone of this movie goes forward with that 
fish out of water story is really heartwarming. The relationship between her and Steve Trevor is really heartwarming. Really good chemistry between those people. I actually don't mind the third act villain. A lot of people really get hard on this movie for the reveal of Ares and the CGI spectacle fight in the third act. I don't think it's that bad. I'm still pretty entertained by that point, so it's never been a big issue for me. And it's just, it's something about that hope that this movie gives. Not only with the DCEU, but just the message of Diana and Wonder Woman. She was kind of like the replacement for the hope that Superman typically gives. It's a movie that's very rewatchable, and the things that it tries to come across with, with that inspiration, and even just the scene with the no man's land, and just watching her rise up against the stairs and just run right at the enemy, it's continuously effective. So highly enjoy Wonder Woman. It's a shame the sequel wasn't as good. It's a shame that we might not see this version of Wonder Woman again. Time will tell, but this original film is damn good. But coming in at number one easily for me is Man of Steel. This is one of those movies that I genuinely don't understand a lot of the criticisms for. Like, a lot of times I can understand where people are coming from. There's issues that they have that I just don't have that issue or I might have an argument against. But this is one of those few movies where when people shit on it and try to explain why it's a terrible movie, my brain just short circuits. Now, granted, I've never been a big Superman fan. I've never been a huge fan of the original Superman films. They were always a bit too lighthearted and goofy and campy for my tastes. And even the character of Superman as a kid, I was never really that into. It was always too powerful for my tastes. I always liked Batman and Spider-Man, some of those more tragic characters. And this was the first take of Superman that I really latched into. So Man of Steel is not only my favorite DCEU film, it's genuinely one of my favorite comic book films of all time. I think that Zack Snyder's style is just on fire with this one. I love Henry, Henry Cavill in the role. I love Michael Shannon as Zod, and a lot of the other supporting characters I think was a really good casting, have really good chemistry with Henry Cavill, and have continued to throughout the movies that he and they have been in. I think that all the action sequences are solid as hell, and the more grounded take on an alien that is torn between his home world and the world that he currently lives in and should he be a hero and when is the right time to be the hero and the teachings of two different fathers. I think that it does a really great job at exploring all of that. And the third act where it's just absolute chaos and destruction and death, like, it makes fucking sense. I'm sorry. If you had two superhuman beings fighting, shit's gonna happen. Shit's gonna get tore up. People are gonna die in the process. I'm sure if Superman had his way, nobody would, but he was trying to stop Zod the entire third act. So again, one of those things that I'm just like, how is that an issue? But nonetheless, that's my opinion. I know people, some people don't love this movie. Some people aren't as high on it as I am, but I absolutely adore it. It's easily my number one film in the DCEU. Well, that's it for this one, guys. That is my updated DCEU ranking. Please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews, and I'm gonna put that playlist of all the DC movies I have fully reviewed as well. Please check out Aura in the video description below and like and share and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss everything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.